Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. Preserving the shrine of Texas liberty for generations to come. It's no small task. It takes a community, a state, a vision. Today, we will help break down the Alamo plan step by step, taking you on a descriptive tour through the Alamo grounds to illustrate the massive preservation and conservation efforts already underway and the ambitious work to ensure we always remember the Alamo. I'm your host, Emily Bauckham. We're joined by Dr. Kate Rogers, Executive Director of Alamo Trust, Inc. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a question that sounds basic, but is really quite powerful. What does the Alamo mean to you? Oh, gosh. Um, As a native Texan, you know, I think about the Alamo as core and central to our identity uh, as a state, as people. It's, you know, the beginning of what makes Texans different and why this big, wonderful thing that we call home, you know, that Steve Harrigan has written about so beautifully. um, I think so much of our story is encapsulated here at the Alamo. The Alamo plan has three main pillars that we're going to break down a little bit later, but just to get started, what are those pillars? Uh, Well, the first is about, you know, really bringing back a sense of respect and reverence to this hallowed site where people fought and lost their lives. Uh, Sometimes over the years through commercial development, some of that sense of reverence has been lost and we want to bring it back. Preservation of the church and the long barrack is central to everything that we do. You know, the church and the long barrack are actually artifacts number one and two in the Alamo collection. They're our most important architectural artifacts for sure, and both of them are in need of some pretty critical restoration. And then, you know, so we talk about preserving the past, making sure that the structures are standing for future generations, but it's also with an eye toward the future, creating a a wonderful new world-class visitor center and museum and really a world-class experience across the entire site. And as you said, preserving the fragile 300-year-old church in Lawn Barrack, obviously a key priority. How is that already happening? And then what is the longer term plan? Uh, It's interesting because there's a lot of science that goes into the restoration of of these 300 some odd year old limestone structures. And it it began like most science projects do, if you will, with a lot of research and analysis. And so over the years, there's been a number of studies on the structures themselves. The the most recent was a year-long moisture monitoring program that was really designed to track the movement of salt and water, in particular, within the walls. That's what's causing uh, a lot of the stone loss. The salt level or salt content within the walls is is pretty high because of the level of nitrates in the soil that sits below the Alamo Church in particular. And some of that was driven by the fact that at one time in the Alamo's history, back when it was a mission, there were people buried inside the church. And so the goal is to figure out, you know, how how that moisture is moving. Uh, the, the goal is to actually stabilize the salts. The salts are what is ca- causing uh, the mortar and stone loss that you see. You can see it inside the church today. And so you want the st- salts to deactivate, if you will. Moisture makes them activate. want to take the moisture out, but not too much because you don't want to dry out the stone. So it's very, very delicate. We've got a wonderful team of preservationists from all over the world that we've assembled to make sure that we do it right, carefully, uh, and with uh, great respect. Then recapturing the original mission site, an 1836 battle footprint, that is no small task given how downtown San Antonio really grew up around the Alamo in the nearly 190 years since the battle. People often think the Alamo is only the church, but it was a four and a half acre mission and fort. So how is recapturing that footprint progressing? Yeah, one of my favorite questions that people ask when they come on the site is, why did they put it downtown? Uh, And as you stated, really, the town grew up around uh, the Alamo mission. And it's interesting because that's that was the goal of the mission, right? It was to establish community in an outlying region or area of a territory. Uh, And the Spanish missions in that regard were quite successful. And now you have the seventh largest city in the United States that grew up around the Alamo. But when people come here, you're right. They think that the iconic church, which is the structure we've all seen in multiple movies and television shows and books and so forth, 
that's what we think the Alamo is. They don't understand that it was originally designed, again, to be a mission, a community, a compound, if you will, and that it had structures sitting all around it. And people actually lived here for many years before the historic or famous Battle of 1836 actually occurred. And so moving forward to recapture that footprint, what's the work been happening behind the scenes? Uh, well, there's been a lot of design about the, the plaza experience. Um, the plaza, the, the Alamo plazas, I should say, with the North Plaza, which is where the battlefield and the mission footprint actually reside. But also the South Plaza are important to telling the full history of the site. South Plaza would have been the entrance to the, to the old mission. And uh, so that will be brought back as a community gathering space. We're really working on leveling the grade, removing a lot of the curbs and and sidewalks and bollards and so forth so that the whole Alamo Historic District in the future feels much more pedestrian friendly. It was originally designed for vehicular traffic. Uh, and so it'll be more shaded, more comfortable, more accessible for people who have mobility concerns. And so that's a big part of what's been going on. And then through the paving, you'll clearly know once you enter the Mission Gate to the south or you come up along the promenade from the Riverwalk, you'll know I am now stepping foot because the paving looks different onto the actual historic footprint. A distinct difference. Yes. Establishing a world-class destination, undeniably a monumental task. Could you break down the site's recent achievements, like the opening of the Ralston Family Collection Center, and outline for our audience what's coming over the next four to five years? Sure. Uh, you know, we've there's been multiple plans that have been put forward over the years to try to do something a little bit different with the Alamo. Sometimes people in the past have come to the Alamo and said things like, is that it? Or I thought it would be much bigger. Um, maybe they didn't understand the full history or its importance to the story of Texas and to the story of the United States. And so we, we certainly want them to leave with that in their mind and a memory that they'll never forget. Uh, so we've been working on some exterior exhibits. We added the Palisade Wall. That's the wall where most historians believe that Davy Crockett and the Tennesseans were positioned during the famous battle. We added the 18-pounder Charlie LaSoya House exhibit that sits at the exact southwest corner of the fort. And as we've been talking about, that's another great way for people to understand the true size and height of the compound itself, and to know that with just 189 men, how difficult it would have been to hold and defend during the battle itself. Uh, we also added uh, the Ralston Family Collection Center, which you mentioned. That's the first new building on the grounds of the Alamo since the 1950s. It's a 24,000 square foot building. It houses a number of artifacts from the famous Phil Collins collection, the British rock star who generously donated his collection to the state of Texas a few years ago. Uh, and then beautiful objects from the Donald and Louise Yenna collection. That's a Spanish colonial collection and Donald and his wife Louise are, are native to San Antonio. They're local here. Uh, and they had a collection almost the same size as the Collins collection, but focused on really the 70s. 1700s. It's truly an impressive building. And if you've been to the Alamo recently, you've no doubt noticed some construction in the street. Yes. That's all centering around the Mission Gate and Lunette exhibit and the future Plaza de Valero you spoke about a few minutes ago. When it's all done, it's really going to be a new space for our community and for the Alamo's visitors from around the world. Yes, and, and that's the goal. So right now we get about 1.6 million people a year who come to the Alamo. People always ask where they come from. More than 50% of our visitors come from other parts of Texas. Just shortly behind that would be other parts of the United States. Many, many visitors from uh, as far west as California and the East Coast as well. Then international visitors. So one of our goals is to get people local to San Antonio to come on back down and see what's new at the Alamo. We definitely want that. And can you tell us a little bit about Plaza de Valero and when do we expect construction on the plaza to be complete and what we're going to see out there? Yes. Yeah, so, so as you mentioned, the Mission Gate and Lunette and Plaza de Valero are both under construction now. So you'll see you know, lots of fencing out there. We're working on the paving to level the grade. The Mission Gate and Lunette itself was actually 
mostly done in May, and then we closed it to finish the landscape elements around it. And interestingly, that structure was actually done by local artist Carlos Cortez of Studio Cortez. He and his sons worked on it. That's a third generation artistic endeavor. And really interesting, Carlos works in the faux bois technique. So when you look at the lunette, which was a military fortification added by the Mexican army in 1835 before the battle, it looks like wood. Uh, as it would have looked like then um, with a dirt berm around it. But actually, it's made of concrete. Uh, and, and he really did a nice job of making it look very authentic. And just to the south of that sits, as you mentioned, Plaza de Valero, which would have been, like I said, the entrance or the welcoming area, the plaza just outside of the historic mission. And so that will become really almost a, a mini park, if you will. It's the front yard to the Manger Hotel, the beautiful historic Manger Hotel. And so it'll have a nice big grassy lawn where we can do programming and activities for both children and adults. Lots of great planting and shade and uh, areas for seating around it. And our goal is to open it in celebration of July 4th, 2024. And 2024 just happens to be the 300th anniversary of the founding of Mission San Antonio de Valero in its current location. Amazing timing. And a few minutes ago, you mentioned that right now work is being done to grade the ground, make it more accessible, and also do some work because it is hot on the plaza. Yes. So we're addressing that. Yeah. So um, there's two challenges that are presented by the flagstone. Flagstone, of course, is beautiful material. Uh, you know, we all love it as Texans. Unfortunately, with so much of it covering the plaza, it does get very hot. Uh, so in the summertime, when we have days and days of uh, temperatures over 100 degrees, it can get up to 130 degrees on the plaza, which is not very comfortable. In addition to that, it presents a bit of a drainage problem for the for the historic church. Uh, the water from the canales on the roof hits the the flagstone splashes back up into the walls, and so it needs to be removed to prevent that from happening. So that will be a part of it. We'll replace it with something a little cooler uh, in terms of the paving material. It really does all tie together. And in the meantime, there is some preservation work taking place in the future for the Cenotaph Monument, but we want to make very clear it is not moving. Yes, I think we, we've seen that there's a lot of passion about keeping the Cenotaph Memorial in its current location. Um, but it does uh, need some uh, repair. There's some spalling taking place in certain locations, uh, some stone loss. And so the next step in the historic investigation is to get inside of the structure. So you'll start to see right around the beginning of November, you'll see some scaffolding go up and some you know, workers, um, the top will be removed, but don't fear, don't become alarmed. Uh, they're just doing what needs to be done for the investigation to, to come up with a roadmap for repairs. And what we've committed, because we know the concerns are out there, is that as the repairs are, are taking shape and evolving, we will do them on site. So even if a stone needs to be, one of the big marble stones needs to be removed and repaired, we'll do it here on site at the Alamo. And there will be transparency so people can watch this in real time. Oh yes, we'll have a camera so you can actually, you know, you can watch it. We have a camera right now where you can see what's happening on Alamo Plaza 24 7. We have the Alamo Plaza That's live right. cam and then a separate Cenotaph live cam. That's right. And the construction fencing won't be wrapped so people can watch yes, on the plaza. Yes, as much visibility as possible. We think that's better just because we know there have been concerns in the past. Let's move across the grounds. By 2025, the building we know as Alamo Hall is going to look quite different. It's going to be transformed into the Texas Cavaliers Education Center. And I know you are very excited about that. I am. Um, you know, education is a great passion of mine. And really, when you think about a historic site like the Alamo, you know, we just have such an opportunity to bring history to life for both teachers and students. And that's really a big part of our goal uh, in the redevelopment effort. So the Texas Cavaliers Education Center will also be about 22,000 square feet. It'll include an orientation theater. So if, believe it or not, we get about 140,000 school-aged children on the grounds each and every year right now. We hope that grows to about 250,000 in the future, but the children have never had a place where they could sit and maybe watch a nice high quality film to show them about why this site matters so much and why they should care before they go out to explore. The center will also include multiple flexible classroom spaces that can be configured to accommodate different sizes of groups. 
two areas that I'm really excited about. You have the STEAM lab. And for listeners who don't know what that means, right, what is a STEAM lab? It's science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And maybe we don't think, like, what, what would you be teaching about science at the Alamo? But there's actually quite a bit here because we have archaeology. We've got conservation. You know, we were just doing uh, an experiment. Uh, we were looking at um, a mock-up of the historic church and some cleaning techniques for how do you clean some of the, the natural uh, blackness that has, you know, the growth that is incurring on the stones. And we were looking at a... a highly sophisticated laser technology that has wow. been developed to do that without harming the stone. And so wonderful for students to be able to see how that works and do experiments of their own. Uh, and then we have an early learner space. So think about kiddos, you know, like pre-K age, where we can do story time, we can do dress up, we can do build a fort activities and really get them interested in their history at a very, very young age. Uh, there's also plans for a learning stair, which is a great space for programming, but also just a really nice shaded area for the kiddos to eat their lunch. And that's something that kids haven't had before, a no. place to call their own at the Alamo that's where they right. can just sit and eat their lunch. That's right. And and really educators too. You know, the team has really been working to grow what we call Teach the Alamo, which are professional development opportunities for teachers from all over San Antonio, Bear County, and the state of Texas. Uh, and that will be a dedicated space where we can do that. So think by the summer of 2025, we'll be having week-long institutes for teachers that they can come and spend a week here in San Antonio, maybe visit the other missions, some of the other Texas Revolution sites, and really get a feel for you know how to, how to bring some of that learning into the classroom for their children. But we can also have Camp Alamo for children of all ages, which is very exciting. Uh, we'll also have a distance learning studio inside that space. So for kids who can't make the journey for whatever reason, uh, and that could be throughout Texas, but it could also be beyond our borders. Uh, and we can bring that programming to life for them inside their classroom virtually. When you think about it, there were Alamo defenders from Western Europe. So perhaps the Alamo could even connect with schools universities in other parts of the world. Yes. And I think, you know, we have sister cities, also San Antonio does all over the world, from Japan to Europe, as you mentioned. And uh, we know that people, Phil Collins is not the only person from the UK who has a great interest in the history of what happened here. And so, yes, our goal is to, is to really go global with the programming. And we should note, great measures are being taken to preserve the historic components of Alamo Hall, the original fire station number two, for the city of San Antonio. Yes, yeah, so Alamo Hall, I think, has, you know, it was a, an event space for the Daughters of the Republic of Texas for many, many years, and people remember it fondly that way. And as you mentioned prior to that, it was a fire station. And so we will preserve that building completely intact, including the historic floors that were actually put in during the Work Progress Administration under FDR. So much history here at the Alamo. And of course, the crown jewel of the Alamo plan, the Visitor Center and Museum, scheduled to be complete in 2027. Where will it be located? The new Visitor Center Museum will be located across the street from the Alamo Church. So it's across Alamo Street. It's in what we call the historic Crockett Block buildings. It's three historic buildings, the Crockett Building, the entrance to the old Palace Theater, and the Woolworth Building. And the Woolworth Building, which sits at the intersection of Alamo and Houston Street, is a state antiquities landmark because of its role in the civil rights movement here in San Antonio. So inside that building, you'll have eight galleries uh, in total. They're chronological in nature. So you begin at the beginning of the story when the first indigenous people arrived in this part of Texas more than 10,000 years ago. You move up through the mission, um, Spanish colonial era, Mexican rule and the Texas Revolution, which was a very um, conflict-ridden and complicated part of the history from 1805 to 1835. Of course, you'll have a very large gallery dedicated to the battle itself, and then two galleries that really talk about the history that happened after the battle. Uh, the first, the Army Quartermaster era, which began in the 1840s, and then From Ruin to Memorial, which really digs into the preservation movement that swept across the country at that time, mostly led by women uh, and also led by two amazing women here in San Antonio, Clara Driscoll and Idina De Zavala. And then when you walk into the lobby, there's going to be a lot there too, and that part will be free to visitors. Yeah, so... 
by state statute, uh, the church and the long barrack and the grounds themselves will always remain free. And there'll be lots to see and do. We talked about some of the outdoor exhibits that are out there today, much more interpretation across the grounds and even down into the Plaza and Alamo Promenade in the future, as well as the, the entire first floor of the new Visitor Center Museum, which will have some really beautiful uh, statuary vignettes that talk about the 300 years of history and a very large civil rights exhibit. So in the floor of the Woolworth building, you can still see where the lunch counter once stood. That was a part of the movement here locally. And uh, we'll do a great exhibit there that includes a lot, a number of graphic as well as digital elements to bring that story to life. The civil rights exhibit will have the recreation of the Woolworth lunch counter. And in the lobby, there will be something unique with the Western wall footprint. In the Crockett Block buildings, uh, that's where the west wall of the original mission and fort would have run. So we're going to do a really wonderful interpretation of the wall, where it would have stood, how it was constructed, uh, and with some projections on it, even spaces for artifacts held within it. And, and you come to the place like the Trevino House, which is where one of the statue vignettes will be located, and you'll get to experience William B. Travis seated at his desk in the place that would have served as his headquarters during the battle at Self, and he'll be sitting there penning his amazing victory or, or death letter that was sent out to try to bring help um, to the Alamo. Truly bringing history to life. Yes. And speaking of that, the 4D theater. Yes. So up on the second floor of the museum will be the 4D theater. And that is an experience that a visitor could choose to do that as a standalone or to do that along with the galleries themselves. It's roughly a 30 minute experience. So, you know, you get a lot of history in a pretty condensed uh, period of time. But imagine you're surrounded literally with the flora and fauna of Texas through an IMAX experience, two IMAX screens, one slightly larger than the other. And as the film builds to the climax of the battle itself, your seat will shake and the cannons will fire and the smoke and embers will come out. And you'll get a sense of what it might have felt like to actually be there in the early morning hours of March the 6th, 1836. So the Visitor Center and Museum obviously will have a lot of interactive features, yes. but it will also have more artifacts than the Alamo has ever had on display. Yeah, so the Collection Center, the Ralston Family Collection Center, which we talked about, it enabled us to increase the number of artifacts that are on display by five times. But the new Visitor Center and Museum is actually 132,000 square feet, over 30,000 square feet, just of galleries. So a number of the objects that people really had no idea we even had in the Alamo Collection will get to go out on display for the very first time as part of telling that history. So we're very excited about that. Um, we think it'll be a real game changer in helping to bring the stories to life. And we want the Alamo to be a place where you don't just spend 10 minutes, an hour. You spend all day. Yes. And that includes a culinary experience. Yeah, maybe even more than one day, right? So one of the big things on the on the ground floor, there'll be a cafe. And, and we've kind of uh, challenged ourselves with creating something that is not like your typical museum cafe. Uh, something that is uniquely San Antonio and unique to the Alamo and its and its bold history. Uh, and so we hope that folks, even if you just work downtown and you want to go someplace great for lunch, you might you know pop down to the all new experience at the Alamo. There will also be event space on the top floor. Yes, ma'am. So. There'll actually be many spaces across the grounds where people can host events. Uh, sometimes folks don't know that you can do events at the Alamo, um, but you can, and they can vary in size a lot. It could be 100 people. The new space could hold up to 1,000 people. It's up on the rooftop, and it'll have stunning views of the Alamo church, the grounds, and really all of downtown San Antonio, because you'll have not only the beautiful interior space, but terraces on three sides. So you'll be able to see really all of downtown San Antonio. Wow, so everything we've discussed as part of the Alamo plan takes generous financial support. Where's yes, that coming does. from? <laughs> Great question, Emily. Uh, well, we were very blessed because we received a very generous appropriation from the state of Texas during this last legislative session. And that was really thanks to the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Texas General Land Office Land Commissioner Dr. Don Buckingham. They really led the charge in Austin to make sure that that money um, was allocated to help us make this all a reality. 
In addition to that, we have received support from the city of San Antonio, as well as Bear County to help make uh, the dream come true. We've also been raising private philanthropic dollars, and uh, to date, we've raised just over $50 million with a goal of raising $150 million when all is said and done, including an endowment that will help with operating expenses in the future. Because the goal is for the Alamo to be self-sustaining. Yes. One of the things we've committed because, you know, the state and the city have been so generous with us is to say we won't come back and ask for operating dollars, uh, certainly not on an annual basis. With all the many opportunities we're creating across the grounds, we should be able to sustain ourselves financially. And anyone can help out. No gift is too small. That's right. So I like to tell folks, you know, um, if you want to become a member of Friends of the Alamo, that's a great way to support us, start at just $50 a year. And it's also a great way to stay informed of what's going on and to get advance invitations to a lot of the events happening at the Alamo and so forth. Uh, we have a wonderful event coming up on March the 2nd, uh, 2024. That's Texas Independence Day, and it just so happens it falls on a Saturday next year. As we talked about, that's the 300th anniversary of Mission of Mission San Antonio de Valero. So we're going to have a gala, an evening event here on the grounds. Hasn't been done in more than 12 years, and we're going to have some great entertainment Food representing the many cultures of San Antonio uh, and a live auction and all the things you might expect. So um, that's another way that people can support. And then we've got lots of donor opportunities for those, you know, who might be listening who say, you know, I'd really like to make sure that this gets done. It gets done right. And that the Alamo is there to educate all of our children in the future. For people visiting the site the next few years, there will be construction. There yes. already is construction. So what's the best way for visitors to stay on top of the latest information? Uh, well, the, the way I would suggest today is through the Alamo website, which is very easy. It's just thealamo.org, right? All one word. And uh, there's actually a dedicated space that talks about the construction on the website. But we're also working on an app that will launch early next year, 2024, and that will also include information about how to plan your visit and what you can expect when you get here. The team is working really hard through signage and so forth to make sure that, they, that you can still have a really great experience in spite of the construction, uh, but it is a little bit of short-term pain for a long-term gain. For sure. And if anyone has accessibility concerns, mobility concerns, call us. Yes, uh, for sure. Um, you know, we answer the phone uh, seven days a week. Uh, and, and in addition to that, um, you know, like I said, the website is always a, a great resource. And, and the app will also include suggestions of where to park, which is also a big question we get. But when construction is finished in 2027, mission accomplished, the Alamo plan will be a legacy the entire state can be proud of. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's been, I've been here a little over two years now, and it's just such an exciting time to be here. And sometimes you just have to pinch yourself to think, you know, for all of us on the Alamo Trust team who are, who are working on this project, to know that it is really a once in a lifetime thing, right? This is not going to happen again. And our partners, our consultant team, including Gallagher and Associates, who's just amazing, you know, who've worked on Gettysburg and the National World War II Museum and Normandy, they would say that the Alamo is really one of the last great historic sites in the United States that has gone through an effort like this. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a huge honor to be here and something that we, I hope we're all proud of when it's said and done. I asked you at the beginning of this episode, what does the Alamo mean to you? And through this journey of the Alamo plan, you've really discovered this is personal for you yes. as you've now learned you're a descendant. Yes. So I had no idea. Uh, my father was always, my father was a West Point grad, uh, served two tours in Vietnam. So I grew up as an army brat and he was always very passionate about the Alamo. So when I got here, you know, I asked our, our historical research team to do a little bit of research into his family history. Well, lo and behold, we discovered that his great, great grandfather was at one time the mayor of San Antonio, served one term and was married to a woman named Maria Jesus Delgado, who was actually a Canary Islander. And so for anyone who's familiar with the history of San Antonio, they'll know how those 30 plus families from the Canary Islanders were really some of the first settlers to this area. So 
it, it just, it meant so much to me. And I met, you know, a fellow Canary Islander descendant who is related to me and, you know, fourth cousin once removed, you know how that works. And, uh, you know, he sort of started to tear up and he said, you know, I feel like it's fate that brought you here. And, you know, some, sometimes that's kind of hard to believe, um, but it is very special. Dr. Kate Rogers, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a truly eye-opening episode. Thank you. If you'd like more information to learn how you can support the Alamo Plan, check out our podcast notes. We've linked to the Alamo Plan section of our website where you can dive into more details. We'll also link to how you can join Friends of the Alamo. Memberships start at just $50 and include benefits like free admission to the Alamo exhibit. And even if you don't live in San Antonio, joining Friends of the Alamo is a great way to support the preservation and conservation work underway. We also hope you'll follow our social media pages, Official Alamo, all on Facebook, X, and Instagram. We'll be posting regular updates as the Alamo plan takes shape. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs>